again, just a quick reminder, Monday we're having Unit 2 Spanish. Why did I write that down? <laughs> so this Monday, huh? Yeah. Yep. But it's just going to be on Chapter, what, 7 and 8? Is that what I kept on that? Yes. 7 and 8. Small, chop the top off, you know, whatever. Yep, uh, yeah. And that's 
real environmental tools for that one classroom, they don't see it. They see it. Yeah. They don't miss that. So the line of question is, how, you know, I still don't under, fully understand how the Retricular cells and the retricular T cells and the TC cells, how do they kill the cell? Because I got that question wrong. I still try to <coughs> it's very hard to find the name of the name the book to be very precise. And um, no, it's not hard. That, that's probably hard to find because the researchers are still yeah, they said arguing they about how they kill cells. Yeah, but um, then the, my question is there are many. Be wrong. So, well, <laughs> They do induce apoptosis. They do. Um, it is, but it's how? the end result. But you um, have to yeah. pass a hole. That's why that's my answer. Yes. So my yeah. answer is to be right. It's impossible. Yeah. But it's, then they, yeah. my answer is wrong, Mark, that you have passed. Yes. That's why I try to search for the answer. But that's why I, I turn through tests for things like that. And, you know, taking account that there may be questions yeah. like that. But it's like I said, the next exam, I'll, I'll treat each question individually. Yeah, but it's in that case, because I know no matter how they kill, they have to put a memory in force. So that's why I told that answer. Oh, my told that answer, because I learned in anatomy and physiology. That's what a Dr. Stone told us. I said, I'm hurting my head. Yeah. Maybe forever. No matter what, you have a functional call. Yeah. Well, not always. You can signal. You, can, you can't signal for a cell to become apoptotic without functional call. You can signal to other receptors. So, but that, so, but it is true that most T cells, um, the cytotoxic T cells, will will punch holes through perforin, um, and granzyme will go into those holes and start to chew up the cells, and, and eventually they will induce apoptosis after enough damage occurs. But there are also mechanisms that signal through um, actually mitochondrial proteins that will induce apoptosis. But, it's pretty complex, and people are still looking at, um, you know, classically, the idea was that cytotoxic T cells, and that's what we're focusing on here, usually kill through that mechanism, through granzyme, perforin. But there's also um, other mechanisms now that people are, that researchers are finding that they kill through. Um, they're killing through signaling mechanisms, so totally separate from those. Um, they are, there are, um, Death signals that they can send, and, and so they can actually kill without um, that person of granzyme activity. And so, uh, because people were looking at T cells and saying, "Well, let's if we're looking for T cells that kill, let's let's look for T cells that make lots of perforin and granzyme." But they found that there were T cells that didn't make a lot of those things that were still killing. That's why people didn't make a lot of. There are other another class of. Uh, there's still cytotoxic. Classified as cytotoxic. Oh, it's a, 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 so, uh, so there are lots of. Yeah, uh, yeah and you guys don't have to memorize them. So, so, how about on T cell? How do they see yeah. that question? I see you. Well, I'll, we'll, I'll go back and we'll review those in a second. But let's go ahead and finish up uh, Anjan's presentation because uh, NK cells aren't going to recognize MHC. Um, yeah, no. Right. No? And NKT, in fact, NK cells will um, recognize cells that don't have MHC on them, right? And so uh, that's another way that if if you have cells, so one of the mechanisms that, that viruses have to kind of evade detection is they have genes that will downregulate MHC molecules. But then that's why it could possibly be developed, have cells that go around looking for MHC molecules on our cells. And if they find cells that don't have MHC molecules, then they to get rid of them. So we have this, there's this balance, even with viruses trying to, to kind of sneak in under the radar, they can downregulate MHC molecules, but if they do it too much, they're gonna get they're gonna get found out as well. So um, we we have it's all it's it's basically warfare and <coughs> you know when the virus comes up with a mechanism, we come up with a mechanism and, and we're all always kind of fighting against them. But um, um, they can have to downregulate to class one and class two. Yeah. Oh, because they are virus, they are not, they are foreign, right? Yes. But how do they... So they'll infect epithelial cells. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
epithelial cells and then and, and then cause those epithelial cells to stop um, producing so much MH2 class one because they don't want to alert the immune system to their to their presence. And so uh, tumor cells will do the same thing actually, uh, regulate class two or um, increase the expression of, and we'll look, we'll look a little bit more at the process. And uh, tumor cells or virus infected cells will actually, um, that those that are successful will, will mess with that mechanism, that antigen processing and presentation mechanism. But T cells are only going to see, and that's what we're kind of, they're only going to see, um, become activated in the context of that MHC and in the peptide. So if you're trying to design a vaccine, for example, and you say, okay, I want to design a vaccine that's going to, to stimulate T cells. So we're going to inject peptide into, into patients. And you would say, okay, that's great. But is it going to work for all patients? So you have to look at that peptide. Is it going to be presented one on the MHC molecule? So is it going to, is there an epitope that's going to be presented on the MHC? Is it going to have anchor residues for everybody's MHC molecule? So now it starts to become a little more difficult. Um, also, if I am going to treat, try to treat somebody with T cells. Let's say I let's say I make a and, and this is something that people were looking at doing. They were, they were putting in, they were taking T cells out of patients and they were transducing them with a virus that would now make a T cell receptor that was specific for an antigen MHC combination. But that's only going to work for somebody with that specific MHC and, and whether that if that is present. So it's, um, there is a current treatment actually for cancer that's been very successful where they genetically modified, they took T cells infected with viruses that expressed a T cell receptor that had an antibody um, portion to it. So it, it had, it was a, a chimeric um, antibody receptor. So it was actually a T cell receptor, but it had an antibody it had the variable region of an antibody. So that would allow it to now see peptides or antigens that weren't in the context of the MHC. It could actually bind the whole cell. Um, so it had, the, it had the attributes of an antibody in that it didn't have to see peptides. Now this is not something we even know to the test, but it's just interesting that, that and that takes into account. So that bypasses the need to have the same MHC on everybody. Now I can treat people with everybody because that antibody is going to see, doesn't need to see antigen in context of MHC. So by understanding how T cell receptors work and how they see antigen, um, this group was able to kind of bypass that and make an uh, antibody um, T cell receptor. Either a different one, or we may have some alleles in common, mm -hmm. but then we have others that aren't because mm -hmm. you're just mixing and matching. Them. So we're not going to have a perfect match, but we're all going to share. We all may share some common alleles, um, especially within um, within your your um, different regions. If you are from a, a different region, um, you you may have a common allele with most people. For example, Caucasian. Um, there's a DR. Um, one is very common, but then a variant uh, of that is more common in uh, Af people of African American descent, and then um, people in, from uh, another region might have a different little. So again, um, people who are researching these things have to keep that in mind, especially when they're um, trying to make therapies for people. What kind of um, study that you it's pretty broad. Um, like, for example, if you wanted to do clinical research, you, you, you would have to. Um, it just depends where in the in the, the mechanism you wanted to be. Did you want to be more at the, the clinical side or more at the research side? Um, 
more of the clinical side, uh, you could um, have a master, as long as you had a master's in, in pretty much any of the sciences, um, or bi biological sciences, you could, you could do that type of research, that would be the top. In fact, a lot of universities that uh, prepare people to do immunological research don't have it necessarily in immunology, you could come do. Um, and, and you would get it in, in uh, cell biology, biochemistry, um, any of those uh, fields, even just a biology degree, and then you would do research for somebody who is doing immunology. And you could say, that's really my specialty is going for immunology. Uh, researchers doing uh, immunological research for somebody. Um, <coughs> so if you want to get into more in the clinical end, you may want to go um, get a, a bachelor's in some type of biology, a master's in, in any type of the sciences, and um, but then get, um, there are programs for um, clinical research, and, and that wasn't my area, but um, there are degrees that, that will prepare you to be able to actually do more of the clinical end. interested in doing research and wanted to go more to the clinical end, um, there's a lot of ways to do it, but you may want to get some type of a nursing or, or MD to do that. I had a few other questions about immunotherapy and the environment. My staff said one of them. Go ahead. Yeah. What is the name of that event? Immunotherapy? Mm -hmm. You said that you were using the environment to transfer the... Yeah. It's just a delivery mechanism to get the gene expressed in the cell. Uh, a lot so what kind of viruses? Like lentiviruses. Like they they used to use retroviruses, but um, they tried to kind of frown on retrovirus um, for a delivery mechanism because there was actually an incident where um, clinically uh, retrovirus was used to deliver a gene, and then that retrovirus um, knocked out a really important gene, and you had people so the antivirus is safer now. Lentivirus is safer wide. than retrovirus. Yeah. But if you're looking, if you're trying to treat, again, if you're trying to treat something that's like stage four cancer, which is a benign illness, you know, um, I mean, we give people chemotherapy, and that's not the safest thing to do. Um, so. Rodney, how, you know, when you catch that in the virus, we have certain. Well, for something like this, let's, let's think about it. So you're using a virus to deliver a gene. <coughs> and let's say it's very inefficient, and you only get really even a small percentage of the cells get that gene. Um, what happens, and we're going to talk about this in the next few chapters, what happens when a T cell sees its antigen, that T cell now clonally expands. So really, you don't have to be very successful at getting a gene when you're doing an immune therapy. You just need it in a few T cells. As long as a few T cells get it and see antigen, they're going to clonally expand and they're going to be able to. One T cell theoretically could, could wipe out a, a, you know, a, quite a few cells. So you don't need um, that many uh, T cells. So it, it, th that's actually um, nice when you're looking at immune therapies in that you don't have to get um, the technology, current technology is sufficient to really um, get pretty big responses. Whereas when you're trying to change the gene globally in a patient, um, now you're really going to be concerned with your transduction efficiency, so the efficiency to be able to express that gene in a lot of cells. <coughs> for, so for this, uh, it, it's not as important. So this is in GMP. No, most of the people will take foot blood out. They'll they'll do this in vitro and then give it back to the patient. Yeah. Oh, it's like you know, like they manipulate. The so they take like an apheresis product, uh, an apheresis product. So they'll stick two two a needle in each arm, yeah. run blood through, collect uh, leukocytes, uh -huh. white blood cells, give you back your red blood cells, so they can actually get a large amount of um, white blood cells, and then they'll take those and they'll um, infect those with the virus um, 
and these are non-replicating viruses that they made in the lab that are just used to get the genes in and then express. And then those will be now, um, sometimes they'll even sort those based on whether they express whatever protein or, or gene you want to express, and then those are given back to the patient. So the filters have been done to really make sure that there are people doing similar things? And leukemia is one where you're already um, treating patients by collecting yeah. either bone marrow from them or um, or an apheresis product beforehand from the same patient, and then wiping out their basically giving them ablative chemotherapy to where you've wiped out their immune system and then giving those back. So that's a common therapy already without any type of manipulation of the cells. So um, yeah, that's. So there's different <coughs> antigen processing and presentation pathways for class one and class two, and that allows them to present either endogenous mostly or exogenous antigen. And um, so just in a, in a nutshell, um, class one molecules um, will be made into the, into the ER and the endoplasmic reticulum. And they will basically be kind of naked. They will associate with a complex, the TAP complex, uh, and we'll talk about that in a sec, that is basically localizes them closely with the area where you're, you're making small peptides. So those peptides are being chewed up, brought into the proteasome, and then loaded onto MHC class one, and it then traffics to the cell surface and presents those antigens. Um, so, in effect, a pretty straightforward, simple process. Class two, um, and it's not showing it here, but class two associates with a chaperone uh, protein called the class two associated um, sub uh, the invariant chain. They call it the invariant chain. And it's invariant because uh, class, your um, it's, it's preserved, so in that we have MHC class two, we have all these different alleles for everybody. We all have the same invariant chain. So that, they called it invariant chain because it was expressed within this, in this part of the chromosome that expresses other genes. <coughs> so those genes, we have lots of different alleles. But then there was this preserved, uh, what, what's called invariant chain. And that invariant chain was the chaperone in it. It basically um, associates with class two, the alpha and the beta, and it will block that antigen binding group. So with class one, that antigen binding group is open. So we've got this antigen binding group, and it it will it'll you know peptides will float in there if they have the right anchor peptides, the anchor amino acids. It'll sit in there, and then it'll traffic to the cell surface. Class two, the invariant chain, it associates really strongly with the alpha and the beta, and it kind of blocks that antigen binding group. It sits in that antigen binding group until MHC follows. So now, now that the class two will traffic into the Golgi, and then it'll traffic into these endosomes and, and these late endosomes. So you have these. Um, in antigen presenting cells, you'll be bringing in um, exogenous material. It comes into these really acidic compartments with um, enzymes that chew up peptides. And they chew up peptides, but they also chew up that invariant chain. And that invariant chain eventually gets removed, and then peptides get loaded into your MHC class 2 molecule here, where um, the majority of those peptides available were from the exogenous source. And so that's how you can kind of differentiate and say, okay, we're gonna present mostly exogenous antigen because we can only bind to antigen in a place where it's mostly exogenous, whereas class one, it comes into contact with antigen where it's mostly endogenous antigen being recycled within the cell. Now I say endogenous, um, that could be a viral antigen made inside the cell. It just means that that protein was initially made inside the cell as opposed to exogenous antigen, it 
some proteins that were either floating around out here because the cell died. So it could have been made in a cell at one point. It just wasn't made in this cell. It could have been made on, on, a, on a bacteria. It could have been made wherever, but it was brought into the cell. And so, and that's mostly going to be your antigen for that insect to do that. Constitutive 
froze zone, we'll, we'll get loaded on them with some questions. But the, the mean froze zone is a little more efficient and will produce higher numbers of peptides that are going to be bound to the um, So after your peptides get chewed up from the proteasome, they will, the proteasome will associate with this CAP, these CAP1 and CAP2 molecules, and will actually um, start to feed these peptides into the ER. So think of CAP as um, like a, 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 a beer tap or something. You're tapping a hole into uh, the ER and allowing now this, these peptides to enter into the ER. So the cap, it, it's a cap by which proteins will enter. <coughs> it's an easy way to remember that. CAP stands for transporter associated with antigen processing. It's a little more difficult to remember. So Associates with the proteasome allows for the, the peptides to enter into the ER, and these peptides will normally be found in the ER. Most of these in the ER, you will find whole proteins being there. So this allows this is the mechanism by which they enter, and so you can really affect um, a cell's ability to present endogenous antigen if you knock out cap. So if you knock out cap. Then, and, and this is why TAP is a target for a lot of, a lot of viruses will target TAP. So they will downregulate TAP so that you don't get so much of that viral antigen being loaded onto MHC. So TAP is a target for, for viruses. Um, and if there's any defect in TAP, you have trouble presenting um, antigen, uh, endogenous antigen. So if you uh -huh. take all the cap, they cannot get into your cell. So they can't get into the rough ER. So you've got you can you can chew up proteins. <coughs> and, and so um, viruses target the proteasome itself. Viruses will target cap. Um, those are two major focuses that, that viruses have evolved to attack. Um, but once peptides enter, there is this whole um, set of chaperones that aid in MHC class 1 assembly. You've got calnexin, calreticulin, and tapetin um, associated with TAP helps control the MHC class 1 and <coughs> close proximity to TAP. So these all associate. So you get um, MHC class 1. Uh, calnexin will, will in, as a chaperone, will kind of bring it into close proximity with the, um, these other Molecules, you'll have your um, tapicin and calreticulin will now also associate with that. And this helps, this brings it into close proximity with TAP. And then um, ER aminopeptidase, this ERAP1 prim long peptide. So there's even more um, editing occurring. So ERAP1, uh, and these are what these are basically what you need or prim small peptides, because again, we have to be within that, that range to load it on MHC class 1. Do we need to know all this to detect them? Uh, you need to know ERAP1 is what it does. Prim, prim is basically um, prim small peptide into the right side. And then they're, they're able to get loaded onto MHC class 1 that will then exit the ER. So the, the e, ERP57, um, once it changes configuration, once it's bound to this whole complex, then it is now um, associated with TAP. So it's, it's the, the, if you can see, they're trying to show you that how these all fit onto this ERP57. So it's the recycled cycle peptide inside the RER that sucks up the MHC. Yeah so, we, so once, yeah, so once the these binds the peptide, uh, so once the MHC binds the peptide, it changes in shape enough to where it now disassociates from the whole complex. Okay. So 
basically, um, uh, similar to how antibodies, remember how we said when antibodies go out to antigens, um, it would change, they would change their, their conformation. Um, and, and it would allow them to now um, signal um, to the cell. So that's how, that's how the same type of mechanism, but instead of signaling, now it's just released because it changed shape, changed its conformation enough to now um, disassociate with that. So the shape, it's, it's native shape will bind. It, it will bind to this whole complex until it binds to energy. Once it does bind to energy, So what's my final to whole proton chain then before the final energy? What's the okay? So what's the the ERP three seven? Final whole bound calculator L. What's the Kelmason? Kelm red. Yeah, Kelmason. It's just a chaperone that will now associate with MHC. So MHC plus one and Kelmason mm -hmm. will now associate with these beta two microglobulin. And then calcitin um, will now come in and calreticulin. And so it's basically, th these are the steps that it's formed. What's their function? Algorithm. Um, they're just, their function is to help with um, antigens, basically loading with antigens. A lot of these will just open, maybe they'll open up that binding group. So the function is just basically to localize it to TAP and to change it, to basically to allow for peptides to now enter the groove. Um, if you look at the shape, um, for example, the, and you don't need to know this, but the calreticulin will bind on there and then it'll open that up and allow for, open which it, it'll open up this binding group so that it'll allow peptides to now enter and if they have the right anchor residues, then they will bind. It will then stabilize that MHC um, shape, and then it will become tightly associated with that. If they don't have the right, they'll load a peptide, it won't bind tightly, it won't change the conformation, and then they'll load another peptide, and so you get this peptide basically editing, where it will, it'll look at a peptide if it doesn't have the right anchor residues, it'll chuck it, get another one, so it kind of makes, it, it, it forms that complex that allows for those peptides to, to enter. Once a peptide enters, it binds, then that will basically firm up that, that um, groove and they'll change the conformation to where this now disassociates from that complex and it travels onto the cell. So, the ERP could be kind of Thank <laughs> you. 
binding group is accessible to <coughs> those peptides, and those peptides will bind. Um, now, class two also doesn't meet, it doesn't meet half of them, it doesn't meet any of those. But then again, remember class two, so class two is kind of made up by the alpha and beta, right? And their antigen binding group is more open, so it can bind, it doesn't need, it's, it doesn't need a mechanism to open it up to allow for editing. So we have this complex system with capacin, with um, cap, you know, cal reticulum, and, and all those other proteins that kind of allow for editing of peptides. Here, class two, um, MAC class two is a little bit less persnickety about what can what it can see or what can go, go into it, and it's just a line of anything, and that will get chewed back, and now you have your, your antigen. Right? But so, they need to still need a process. Yes. Um, when you say endosome, yeah. you know when when you have this some like a wider in a bacteria, mm -hmm. there are different pathways. You said that, you know, why don't they are doing cytosine in less and more bacteria are not in cytosine? Well, some set bacteria are intracellular and some but, are, are When they say intracellular, that means they are doing an endosome? Um, it depends on the on the virus or bacteria, like the virus will be uh, it's just gonna integrate its genome will integrate it so it's technically in your nucleus, the virus, right? And so it's making proteins, and those proteins will get chewed up. So um, the bacteria, when, when I say endosome, these are going to be, usually when something comes into a cell through the endosome, it's going to get chewed up. That means the endosome is going to, it, it's part of a process. It's part of endocytosis, it's part of endocytosis, that at, you're going to get this active formation of this endosome, it's going to fuse with um, lysosomes. It's going to have uh, enzymes, and oftentimes a very acidic environment with lots of um, uh, reactive oxygen species that are again going to chew that up and into small pieces, and that will vanish. So the variant chain is what guides and the transport of class two. Um, so class two is an alpha and a beta. Those, that alpha, so you've got the ER, your, your rub ER, and your alpha, and your beta. Um, <coughs> alpha and beta will get stabilized by this invariant tune. Okay, so uh, written by big I, little I. So this is your invariant tune here. And it's going to stabilize that alpha and the beta. And in general, the alpha and the betas um, need that e need to either be bound to peptide, or they need to have this invariant chain stabilized. Otherwise, they stay separate. And they aren't a heterodimer until that happens, and they won't traffic to the subsurface. So, so they they need to have, and this invariant chain also has um, signals on it that will allow it for entry and traffic to the endosome and to the cell surface. So it has to associate with that invariant chain or it has to become stable in order to traffic to the cell surface. Do you have the similarity of functions? You mean what chromosome or? You know, where do they come from? Does it see the endosome? It's made in, just like alpha and beta, it's made in the uh, endosome and the rough ER. By what? By it's part of the same genetic, uh, it's part of that same group of genes that is making the uh, MHC molecules. It's part of that same set of, um, so it's always been made in cells, or at least APC. So, so when, when you express MHC very tightly, the transcription is very tightly regulated with the MHC in class two molecules. Is that just a mechanism that definitely guards against as long as you don't change the molecule and use that? That well, once MHC right. class two molecules, it, it shares the same promoter as alpha and beta. Yeah. Um, so so once, so once the cell starts making alpha and beta, it's also going to make some variants. MHC, MHC 
see, we try not to see two heads by it. We just shoot off fireworks. I don't even put it in here, so sorry. But small part. We recognize by the layout process and the, you know, like the put on the surface of the dendritic cell, or you know, ATC. So this one, the same kind of machine learning thing, was it also machine for bacteria? <coughs> no, the invariant chain, that's our own process. Oh, okay. that, that, that we're making invariant chain. Our cells, our ABCs are making invariant chain. It makes class two. It, it's, it's an important chaperone protein. It's made with, so when, whenever we upregulate, so when a, an ABC, something becomes an ATP, it's got a promoter that will make, it'll make the alpha gene. That same promoter will make the beta, and it will also make that invariant chain. So we're making all these in here. The invariant chain associates oh. with class two. So this, it, we're going to have this alpha protein, right? And here it's in the, it's, it's a transmembrane protein. So now it's on the inside of the ER. So here's the ER. So we have this alpha, we have this beta, and then the invariant chain. And these are all intracellular, or intramembrane, intramembrane, transmembrane proteins. And then that whole thing now is going to traffic into these, up through this, into this Golgi apparatus. Through the Golgi, it's going to form, the Golgi is going to web out these endosomes. And so these endosomes now are going to have proteases that chew up the invariant chain until all that you have left is this little, basically what looks like a peptide. It, it, it's going to just like an antigen, but it's invariant chain. It's going to be the same for everybody. And then what happens is there's another molecule called HLA DM, and that will compete. It'll kind of basically remove the invariant clip, which is the class two um, associated peptide. HLA-DM. So DM is another molecule that is also going to be expressed. DM. So when, for example, this alpha and the beta, this could be HLA, the, the specific gene could be HLA-DR. DR is a, one, of our, one of our alleles. So for example, you, you, we all have DR. We have at least two. Have HLA DR, so like I might I might be DR O uh, four and DR uh, one, um, and so or O one. So I have these DR genes that are in so DM. There's no diversity in DM. It's not like going to be another MHC. It has specificity for this clip, and then we'll remove the clip. And now my HLA DR or my class two. Or if I want to be more specific, my DR class two is now going to be naked. It's going to be floating around in this DR, and then what's going to happen is the cell. This is going to fuse with an endosome that was formed in the cells that brought in a whole protein that got chewed up into little pieces. And now these little pieces will come in contact and load. So we all start out with this, this clip, a little piece of invariant chain stuck in there, that clip gets removed, and now whatever peptides are being chewed up in these endosomes now will get loaded onto the MHC molecule. And, and there is some editing that goes on. Um, if it doesn't have the right anchor residues, it's not going to bind. If it does have the right anchor residues, it'll bind. Um, in, in B cells, there's another molecule called HLA-DO. Well, which will actually edit what peptides will bind. Uh, you don't need to know that. Not like dendritic cells don't express HLA-DO. Um, only B cells do. I don't think it's fully understood why B cells have so 
B cells might present different exogenous advantages than dendritic cells, and I'm not sure there's a hundred percent understanding of, of why is that different, but um, it is. And so uh, there, there are. It, it's a pretty complex process because there's a lot of players involved. But eventually, what you end up with is this exogenous advantage of resilience, and then depending on the cell surface. So take home is. Invariant chain, big eye, little eye, also known as CD74, prevents peptides from binding the group too early in the ER. Um, if you get, if you don't have that that invariant chain, so it used to be thought, uh, the textbooks used to say that uh, without the chaperone, class two could not uh, <coughs> travel to the cell surface. Um, the best. Well, uh, uh, big eye, little eye, in the chamber for trafficking. Uh, it is involved in trafficking, but not essential. So um, our group actually was looking at developing uh, tumor vaccines to where you take the tumor cells and you express, you, you get rid of the invariant chain. And by getting rid of the invariant chain, you would bind to antigens, endogenous antigens in the ER, and then that would traffic and you would get the mutation of endogenous antigens. Um, and and that, that will happen. If you get Why do you want to do that? Um, so if you have a tumor cell, the tumor cells making a lot of proteins that are specific to tumor cells, and it's going to present a lot of proteins that are not normally presented. And so you may have T cells that are specific for those, but you wouldn't normally present them because the variant chain is blocking your ability to present endogenous antigens in class two. Now, if you get rid of that variant chain, you now start to present endogenous antigens in your class two, and you can get helper cells to now use um, basically promote a response against those tumor cells and then um, eliminate the tumor cells and that can bound to be true. So it's, um, you know. Probably the two So those are specific proteases that target, obviously they target the invariant chain but not the, not the alpha and the beta. So the alpha and the beta don't get chewed up, just the invariant chain. And they're specific proteases. So there's certain amino acid sequences that will be targeted by certain proteases, and we've evolved to where invariant chain has a few of those on the side chain here. So there's a couple targets for these proteases. This gets chewed up. You don't have to remember what specific proteases are that do that, but um, it, it's just different proteases, and obviously they're not chewing up the alpha and the beta. So these don't have those same sequences, amino acid sequences, that are targeted by these proteins. Um, so, invariant chain uses um, these sorting signals in its cytoplasmic tail, direct MAC class 2, um, containing vest to uh, vesicles um, that contain peptide uh, indicitic compartments. So, basically, traffic, it helps them to traffic to the vesicles that are going to fuse with these um, phagocytic vesicles. Um, so here we have our alpha and our beta. Our variant chain binds to it, stabilizes that. Now this whole complex will not traffic up. Um, the variant chain gets chewed up. You have this flip, which is the class two associated invariant chain peptide. So flip. So this little flip is still in there. You have peptides. In there, the HLA DM will remove CLIP, DO, at further edits uh, what peptides are bound, and then you will get end up with peptide being bound to class two. So DO, for example, is only expressed in <coughs> cells, not dendritic cells. <coughs> DM is going to be expressed in all antigen presenting cells, otherwise you wouldn't be able to really efficiently remove CLIP. So here's just the comparison of the two. The endogenous pathway associates with this ER257, calverticulin. Um, this whole complex and cap is involved in proteasome, and then you get editing of peptides. And once a peptide binds, it's going to now traffic. It's going to disassociate with that whole complex and then traffic and to the cell surface and present endogenous antigen, whereas the normal function of class two is to bind to invariant chain traffic to endosomes where peptides are being brought in, chewed up, and then uh, DM will remove that clip. Um, DO might compete 
identified which little which antigens are the green percentage, and then that percentage on the cell surface now class two percentage of those thousand antigens. Are you saying that plasma identifies better than the class one? Yes. So class one associates with this whole ERP sixty seven capsaicin, caliciculin, calnexin, that whole complex will form a stable uh, complex that will associate with TAP. Uh, peptides are being brought in and chewed up by TAP. They'll further get chewed up uh, by capsaicin, and it will then um, basically they'll start to go into the antigen binding group um, and be edited. So if the binds well to that antigen binding group, um, that MHC class 1 molecule will now um, dissociate with that complex and trap it to the cell surface. Class 2 um, isn't able to bind to peptides because it associates very quickly and tightly with the invariant chain. Um, oftentimes it stays a separate alpha and beta until it associates with that in the invariant chain. Um, And then once it associates with the very chain, now that antigen binding group is blocked and it will trap it to the endosome. The very chain is chewed up, clip is removed by ABM, peptides bind to the antigen binding group, DO might bind to some of those peptides and remove them and allow other peptides to be bound. And then by that process, you end up with um, an, uh, exogenous antigen. So there's another process called cross-presentation, um, and <coughs> cross-presentation is, is when dendritic cells um, will cross-present um, antigens. So for example, exogenous antigens brought in to an ACC can be redirected to the endogenous. Um, in the, the slides that you guys have that says exogenous, that was an error. So, Exogenous antigens can be redirected to the endogenous presentation <coughs> pathway. Um, this and this is called <coughs> cross presentation. So, um, and that allows antigen presenting cells not only to activate helper cells, but also to uh, stimulate, uh, and, which is important because what the helper cells do is create a cytokine. This is a big example here. Of the the so, this one's a helper cell. So, let's say. Uh, this, this dendritic cell or this B cell takes up an antigen. It processes it and present it, presents it via class two. So exogenous antigen being presented normally via class two. The T helper cell becomes stimulated and it starts to street IL-2. The same cell can take that same antigen, process it, and present it via class one. Now, it's not the same antigen. It could, so if you remember class two, this is, let's say, this is um, this is a piece of, of a protein, of, um, so a viral protein, we're going to call it P1. So this viral peptide is presented via class two. That same protein from that virus can be processed and presented via class one. It can be further chewed back. It could be that same peptide. It could be a different. So that same peptide could get chewed and back, presented via class one, which is called cross presentation, and now you can stimulate on the same cell uh, CDH, and they're going to be in close proximity to those helper cytokines, and they're going to be able to become um, stimulated. And cross presentation has been shown to be very important. Um, it can really um, facilitate uh, a stronger immune response. Uh, it can it can be the difference between getting an immune response and not getting an immune response. So the um, cross-presentation, a lot of therapies have tried to develop peptides that can not only be presented via class, class two, but also <coughs> class one, so that you get that cross-presentation effect. Um, yep, so dendritic cells also, also uh, all APCs present class one as well. Um, and so they can also, there's an alternative pathway where um, exogenous antigens can actually be shuttled and, and presented via class, class one. It's still regulated, it doesn't happen normally, and it's only really been shown to happen in dendritic cells. Um, so, um, so only dendritic 
Ich
don't know if they've even started putting that in books yet, but that is another way to integrate cells, will present. So if you get a lot of cell death in the area, you're gonna have a lot of pieces of pet, a lot of pieces of lipid floating around. Those lipids will have MHC class one molecules on them. They will stick to DC dendritic cells, and those dendritic cells can now accumulate um, uh, in helper cells and cytotoxic cells. And so that's another reason. So then the DC can, can stimulate a helper cell, be a class two, so it's DD4, and it can bind to either to cross presentation of cytotoxic T cells, DD. So these guys will really stimulate each other, lots of cytokines back and forth, and that CD is now going to proliferate and go off until anybody that recognizes. Um, but you can also have. is just one way to get both helper cells and cytotoxic cells being stimulated off of the same antigen presenting cell and um, it really induces, will induce a very strong immune response. Um, and um, so there are other um, other than MHC class one and class two, there are other class one um, like molecules that not only present uh, peptides or, or pro pieces of protein, but um, non-protein antigens can be presented uh, via the CD1 family of non-class two class one. So there are, um, and the only thing you need to know is that if you were asked the question of um, what, what you know what what type of antigens are presented via um, MHC molecules. Mostly peptides, but they can also be lipids um, via the CD1 molecules. And these CD1 molecules, as we discover, those are also important in um, rejection of, of um, organs. And so, uh, a lot more study is being focused on the CD1 family and, and trying to, and, and they may actually even be more involved in um, organ rejection. So these, they, there's not the same type of, um, uh, there's five human CD1 known, genes known, uh, less polymorphism is displaced. And so there, again, <coughs> these more resemble uh, like the gamma deltas in that they present uh, not a huge array of lipids, but specific lipids. Um, and so there's less variation. 